James chapter 1. And I know I won't get through this, but I'm actually kind of laying the ground for work. Uh, I get to come up here and, and teach every so often, and I'm laying the groundwork, and this will get me through about the next five years. Okay. Uh, just remember, we're talking about James. Uh, James in the, in the New Testament is one of the most practical books that we have in the Bible. James is the half-brother of Jesus, and I say half-brother because Mary is his mother, uh, and Jesus, or God the Father, is his, is his uh, father of Jesus. The father of James is Joseph. He's the firstborn son of Joseph and Mary. They had other children uh, later on, but, uh, you know, you can read about that. Let's see, I wrote it down. Matthew 13, 55. It will give you a list of uh, Jesus' uh, family, except for the sisters. It will name the brothers, and then it does not name the sisters. At that particular time, uh, they didn't think that, that women were very, very important, and they did not include them in the scriptures. But it lists his brothers, and then uh, the best sisters. It lists brothers by name. Uh, he was the leader of the church at Jerusalem, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 15. There's, there's four men in the Bible that's named James. Uh, the, uh, one is, is uh, we can rule him out as being the author of James because he died in AD 44. He died too soon. Neither, uh, that was the apostle. Neither of the other two had any influence or anything on the, on the church. And most likely it says it's the oldest half-brother of Jesus because he's listed first in Matthew 13, 55. James challenged Jesus did not to understand his mission in John chapter 7, verse, uh, verses 2 through 5. This is the half-brother. And he's, he's saying, you know, hey, I know you. You're, you're my brother. How can you be the Christ? And I think most of us, I had an older brother, and someone came to me and said he was the Christ. I said, there ain't no way. You know, and I think most of you would do the same way with, with, your, uh, with your brothers and sisters. Later, he became the church of the, Jew, of the leader of the church at Jerusalem. Christ appeared to him in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, after the resurrection. And it mentions James specifically that, that Jesus appeared to him. And that's one of the first post-resurrection post appearances that he made. Now, Paul called him a pillar of the church in Galatians 2.9. Now Paul saw James after his conversion. And this is on the way to Damascus. He actually saw James and he visited him at Jerusalem. Now you can read about that in Galatians 1.19. Paul again saw him on his last visit to Jerusalem in Acts 21, 8, 18. Uh, Peter, after he was rescued uh, from prison, saw him in Acts, uh, or saw, told him in Acts 12, 17, and tell James, go tell James that I am, that I am free and I'm able to go. James was martyred in AD 62, and that's the half-brother of Jesus. The earliest date that we can have on this, uh, some say the 60s, some people say it was in the early 50s uh, in the book of James. And he tells us, and he tells us very plainly who he is, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. He makes no question about who he is. Uh, he is the, uh, the he's the the Lord is the servant of God and the servant of Jesus Christ. And here he's claiming, you know, that yeah, James is my superior. James is above all. And we need to understand. I'm writing this letter to him. James, again, I, I might have said this. I don't know. I 
can't hear myself think up here. James uh, says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect word, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Most of us have learned uh, from experience, I know all of us white-headed people have, that we never pray for patience. Amen. Don't ever pray for patience. Amen. If you pray for patience, uh, the Lord is going to give you many, many, many opportunities to learn to be patient. Yes. And yes. so just, just don't go there, you know, that will, that will come back to haunt you. <laughs> but he says, he's trying to the 12 tribes, if this is basically a, a letter from a Jewish individual to the Jewish people. Uh, it's not it's not written for everybody. We just happen to have a, a version of it here that we can read. But he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, different kind of temptations. First time you read that, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, there's temptations out there. And all these temptations, I don't know that I can count that joy. And you really can't. I mean, you've got to be careful. Here's the thing about temptation. The devil knows what tempts me. That's right. And he knows what tempts you. If he tempts you with something, that might not faze me. I might look at that and say, well, why in the world would you be tempted to do that? Because it's not a temptation to me. And I might be tempted to do something or say something or act a certain way that, you know, it wouldn't phase you. So well, why would that bother him? You know? <clears throat> because the devil knows us. He knows what's inside of us. He knows what's in our heart. He knows if God is in there or if he's not. And we know that, that Satan is going to tempt anybody. Let me tell you, folks, if he will tempt Jesus, the Son of God, or God in the flesh, He'll tempt us. And I promise you that he will continue to tempt and tempt and tempt us until we fall, and we will fall. The reason that Jesus never fell victim to the temptations that Satan put on him is because he's Jesus. You know, he could withstand that. He knew how to deal with it. He answered it with Scripture. Yes. Most of us. Go back many, many years, folks. Most of us, when we get tempted for something, we don't know the scripture to answer. We, we are just people that I'm not saying that we're dumb, ignorant, or stupid, but a lot of times Satan tempts us with stuff that he knows we can't answer biblically. He will hit us where we are vulnerable. And the things that, we, that he hits us with uh, is tough. Count it joy? How can it be joy? Because when you become victorious over that temptation, you know who to thank. Amen. You go back and thank the Lord and thank Jesus Christ because, hey, Father, he tried, but thanks to you, it didn't faze me this time. You know, it, it wasn't a temptation. I know a lot of people through the years and through, through ministry that have, have fallen victim to this thing of, of drinking, you know, and drink has never been a problem with me. Uh, you know why it hadn't? Because I was too cheap to spend the money. I mean, I never, I never would I never would let go of the money. I worked hard for the money. And I would not let go of it to go out there and, and drink it and act like an idiot that I've seen so many of my friends through the years act like. Um, why, why would you want to go out and drink and drink and drink and Supposed to be happy and throw your guts up all over the place. I heard, I heard about a, a woman, you know, her husband, and I'm not, well, I'm not supposed to tell jokes, but this is not really a joke. I, I, I take this and it really happened. I could, I could picture it happen. See if you could picture this happening. Guy would come in and he, he would run to the kitchen sink, throw his guts up every Saturday night, you know. Well, the wife's getting ready for Sunday dinner. She skinned a chicken, left the, the, the skin off the chicken in the sink. You know, she came, she got up the next morning and there's her, son, her husband sitting in the living room with his coat and tie on ready to go to church. And he said, she says, 
what's going on? He says, honey, he says, it happened. It happened last night. He says, what do you mean it happened? He says, I came in, did exactly what you said. I went to the kitchen sink and I threw my guts up. And I looked in there and he said, but with the help of the good Lord and a long handled wooden spoon, I got them all back down. <laughs> Anyway, but be careful about falling victim to temptations. There's all kinds of temptations out there, and some of the things that will hit you won't affect other people. And you look and you say, well, how in the world can they can they do that? My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And that's the other thing we don't want to ever Pray for patience because you will have more uh, opportunity to develop that patience than you can imagine. Let patience have her perfect worry, work, work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I have been told years ago that I was very, very patient. I would go fishing with my father, and my, my father would tell mother when we got back home, I'd catch a bunch of fish that. He is the most patient person I've ever seen in my life. You know, Daddy would throw it out there and he'd be reeling in. Wouldn't even let time the bait settle, you know, fish with a minute or a worm. And he would just be reeling in because he couldn't stand not to be doing something. I'd throw it out there and I didn't throw it back out there, but something hit. Because I figured that's more work. So I, you know, I just, I just took the easy way out and we'd do it that way. But here's the thing about it. When you're patient, a lot of times we're letting the Lord work. We ask him for something and we say, Lord, we want this. And I heard I heard a man praying one time and cold chills all over me. He said, he, he had a, a sincere prayer request, very sincere and like we would have here at church. But he, and he, then he said, and do it now. <laughs> And my eyebrows went up just like Wendy's just now. Did. Went, Whoa. Let's do it now. It's like he's commanding God to do that right now. Well, he had a sincere prayer request. There's no question about that. It was very sincere, very legitimate. He should have been praying. But folks, we're not the we're not the ones that can demand God do something. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, we have to be praying and ask God and ask him for something. And a lot of times we read that uh, when we don't get the prayer request answered the way we want to because we pray amiss. And that praying amiss means that we're praying selfishly. We're praying for what we want, not what God wants. And we're saying, God, we want this done, we want it, and we want it done right now. That's the attitude that we have. We can't do that. Because a lot of times in prayer, when we're praying, we don't get it real fast because God wants to give us the opportunity to continue to ask him. And then when we get it, we know where it came from. We know that he's still in charge and he will give it to us at the right time. Uh, we had a young man that when I was growing up had polio. And Ronnie was, was uh, had, had one leg that was good and the other leg just, just worked as a, a kept him balanced and he would play baseball and he would do all kinds of stuff but he would hobble and he, he was a wonderful wonderful neighbor he went to his mother found out about a faith healer up north somewhere and she was she took him up there and the morning that they they got back at night the next morning we were all down there to see Ronnie we wanted to see him come walking out of that house, you know, on two strong legs and walking up to us and doing everything that we were doing, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't have to hop anymore. And we stood there and we stood there and we stood there. And finally he came out around the side of the house. He went out the back door and came outside and he was just standing there. 
And you couldn't tell if that leg was, was healed or, or not. And so then he started taking a couple of steps. And, and my heart was breaking for him because when he started taking those couple of steps, he was just like he was. He, he was still uh, had suffering from polio. He still was limping like he always did. And so many of that crowd just walked away. Never, never did say anything to him, you know. And there was about four of us stayed right there. And we remained his, his friends. Uh, even to this day, I still see him occasionally, not, not much. Our paths don't cross that much. But I still see him occasionally. And he's still just like he was being, being with the polio. But here's the thing about Ronnie. He's a strong Christian. He still believes in God because God didn't give him the healing that his mother uh, was asking for. He did not turn away from God. He said, God can use this polio that I've got for a reason, and I'm going to let him use me to bring glory and honor to him and to his kingdom. A young man, tremendous, went to work for the post office and actually retired working at the post office. That's just an, an example where some people don't want to keep praying and some people get up. Now listen, folks, God doesn't always give you the answer that you're looking for. What he does is prepare us for the answer that we get. I pray for Jackson. Pray for that little boy, the young man. I, I just say young man. And I pray for him and I pray for him and I cannot imagine for the life of me, what his parents are going through. I have no concept. I cannot put myself in their place to, to watch their son uh, writhe in pain in a bed, uh, you know, and not get any, go through one procedure after another procedure after another procedure and have such difficulty. All the ups and downs, ups and downs. God's going to heal him this time. Well, he did. Well, God's going to heal him next time. Listen, folks, their faith, you might think that they would lose their faith. Their faith is still very, very strong. And I'm speaking for them, maybe I shouldn't, but their faith is very, very strong in God the Father because they know that in the end, where he's going. Mm -hmm. They would like to keep him, just like any of us would, but they know if something happens and he takes that last breath, He's going on to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. And let me tell you something, folks. He'll be running. He'll be playing. He'll be doing all those things that he's been so bedfast that he's not been able to do. Beautiful young man. There were pictures of him out there occasionally. <coughs> he's a beautiful young man. I was amazed at the first time I saw him in a wheelchair. And uh, I, I didn't know what to expect. I really had no, no, no idea what to expect. But I'll tell you like this, he's just like your son or mine. Mm -hmm. And that's what hurts so bad. He's just like your son or mine. No difference whatsoever. His family loves him, they care for him, they want to do all the things they can for him, just like we would be doing. Well, I've run out of time. I would ask you continue to, to pray don't lose patience don't lose hope and continue to ask God to lead and guide us in this church there's so many people that uh, aren't made it I had to work yesterday I'm going to get to stay at the church today. I've got to go back to work today. And I'm already scheduled to work Tuesday. More people are dying than, than you can imagine. And there's a lot, a lot of death, a lot of pain out there, a lot of agony. And I would ask that you would continue to pray for me, that God will use me to bring glory and honor to him and his kingdom, and that God will be with his family who, who lost loved ones. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you. We thank you so much for your love and thank you for Jesus. It's only because of Jesus that we can continue to go. We see so much heartache. We see so much pain.
received so much death and some of these people that's dying, uh, they're not coming to you. From their own testimony, they're not coming to you. So I pray, Father, that you would help us, that we can reach out and minister effectively, that we can get many, many more souls to come to you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and all the things you give us. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you, folks.